thank you, Professor Abdulazim, uh, for this kind invitation to come and uh, visit the beautiful city of Cairo uh, and also to be part of this uh, prestigious uh, public and tabular course. So, as you quite rightly mentioned, I've got two talks this morning, and the first one is on the clinical uh, and radiological anatomy of the intact pelvis, and the second talk is going to move on uh, onto classification systems. Um, this, you know, I was, I was looking through my um, window last night when I arrived, and I looked across the Nile, and I saw uh, all the lights, uh, and it looked beautiful. So I thought I had to put a picture of uh, Bristol and the bridge. Uh, at night as well. Um, so I work in Bristol, which is in the southwest of England. That's fine. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So there's England just there. There's the southwest. Uh, Bristol is here, just south of Gloucestershire. Um, we take a pelvic and acetabular trauma from the southwest of England. We're the major trauma centre for the southwest, so we take all the open fractures, take all the pelvic and acetabular fractures, all the other complex polytrauma. We're going to be moving into a new hospital, so um, things are pretty busy at the moment. And next uh, month, we as an orthopaedic department move into a brand new hospital, which is quite exciting from a trauma point of view. And all the trauma will come there, we've got a new helipad, and everything, so it'll be, it'll be an exciting place to work in the new hospital. <coughs> the anatomy of the pelvis, why is it important? Well, it's key to understand normal anatomy because then you can appreciate what abnormal anatomy is. And until you appreciate what normal is, you won't appreciate that. The pelvis in particular is a marker of energy transfer and therefore a marker of severe trauma or trauma severity and it's essential to understand the pelvis and its contents. We look at x-rays all day um, and it's important to understand the bony anatomy but also understand the soft tissues that go with these bony problems. If you think about the pelvic ring, it's made up of the sacrum, and the paired innominate bones, which are made up of the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis, with, which fuse together. And at the back, they form the sacroiliac joint. At the front, they form the symphysis pubis. There are certain bony landmarks which are palpable on most people. And, and certainly the symphysis pubis, if you feel deep enough, uh, can be felt and can be a site of, of pain or, or, or bruising. The anterior superior iliac spine, powerful on most people, the iliac wing or part of it, uh, and then the posterior superior iliac spine. So these are all bony prominences that we can feel in most people. And it gives us an idea because we've got two sides to compare with. You can compare one side with the other and see if there's any difference between them. The pubic symphysis itself is, is a fibrocartilaginous joint. It's got a, 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 an articular disc which sits in the center, uh, surrounded by fib fibrous tissue. The SI joint, the sacroiliac joint, is split up into two parts, an anterior part and a posterior part. And the anterior part um, is, is mainly the articular portion. Uh, the articular cartilage is on the sacral side, and the fibrous cartilage on the iliac side. That bit there, the front of the SI joint. And then the back of the SI joint is made up of of strong ligaments, the posterior sacroiliac ligament. There are also other stabilizing and supporting ligaments around the pelvis. And certainly if you look on this model here, you can see that there's this ligament here, which is the sacrospinous ligament attaching onto the ischial spine, and then the sacrotuberous ligament attaching onto the ischial tuberosity. And the important factor with these is that it separates the sciatic notches into the greater and the lesser sciatic notches, but also instability, and we'll talk about that in a second. The sacrospinous and the sacrotuberous ligaments, they're two bands, but they do have uh, a, a confluence at their origin. And if you look at the direction of these two ligaments, the sacrospinous ligament is more 
oblique or horizontal, and you could imagine that that probably uh, prevents rotational deformity or helps prevent that. And then the sacro-tuberous ligament, which is more vertical in nature, which probably has, helps a little bit with the rotation, but probably not as much as the sacro-spinous ligament. You have the anterior sacroiliac ligament, which uh, runs across from the front of the sacrum to the front of the ilium. And it's supported by these two other ligaments as well, the ilio-lumbar ligament and the lumbosacral ligament. And then at the back of the, uh, the pelvis, you have the posterior, sacro, uh, posterior sacroiliac ligament complex, which is a confluence of ligaments and probably the, the strongest ligament in the body. Looking at the posterior sacroiliac ligament, I mentioned it, it, uh, it's a confluence of ligaments and it's two main parts. Uh, there's an oblique part which runs from the sacrum to the anterior, superior, and anterior, posterior, superior, and posterior, inferior iliac spine. And then you have more of a longitudinal component as well, which runs down and joins with uh, the uh, sacro tuberous and the sacro spinous ligament also. And this posterior sacroiliac ligament complex gives stability against vertical displacement. The anterior ligament, uh, as I mentioned, runs across from the front of the sacrum to the front of the ilium. And this gives some rotational stability along with other structures also. The ligaments I mentioned, the ilium lumbar and the sacro uh, 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 ligaments, they also provide some stability against external rotation. We've talked about this and I won't dwell on it too much, um, but it's important to realize that these two ligaments have different orientations and could provide different uh, forms of stability to the pelvis. When you look at ligament sectioning studies, if you section the symphysis pubis, so this bit here, you find that there's an anterior diastasis of less than two and a half centimeters. The sacrospinous ligament prevents further displacement, so this is a ligament going in that direction there. And this pelvic ring will be rotationally and vertically stable. Moving on, and then if you section the symphysis pubis and the sacrospinous ligament, these two here, you end up with a, a scenario where you have a rotationally unstable pelvic ring, but it's still vertically stable because the posterior sacroiliac ligaments are intact, or the complex is intact. So moving on, you section all three components. So you section the front symphysis, you section the, the sacrospinous ligament, and you also section the posterior sacroiliac ligament complex. What happens then? Well then you end up with a scenario where you have both rotational instability and you have vertical instability as well. And it's important to understand this because this will form the basis of, 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 the, of the classification and the diagnosis of these severe, severe pelvic ring injuries. It's important also to understand the difference between the true and the false pelvis and, and the, the boundaries of the true and false pelvis. And certainly on, on the x-ray, the uh, iliopectineal line, which is, which is that line there, separates the false pelvis from the true pelvis. And it's important to understand all the structures that run in the true pelvis. There's lots and lots of nerves. Um, some of the more important ones are uh, the uh, L4 and L5 nerve roots, and they just run here, anterior to the sacrum. The L5 nerve root in particular is is at a risk of being damaged when you do an anterior approach to the sacroiliac joint and it lies, it's important to know where it lies and it lies about two centimeters medial to the SI joint. So there's the SI joint there, there's the L5 nerve root running down there. So you've got to be careful when you're doing an anterior approach to the SI joint. But the other important nerve is a sciatic nerve and it forms from a, a, a confluence of these uh, uh, nerve roots, the lumbosacral plexus, so L4 to S3. And it's important to know its relationship to piriformis. And here you see that the nerve usually runs under piriformis, but it can have variation. And it's important to understand the variation 
and it can split, it can sometimes split higher up, so you have uh, one part of the nerve running over the piriformis and the other part running under the piriformis. And when you're approaching the pelvis of the acetabulum, it's important to know this. The other important structures in the true pelvis are, are the, the vascular structures, and the two main arteries are the internal and the external iliacs and the branches of these. And these are very important uh, and can account for about 10 to 15 percent of bleeding, um, or causes of bleeding in the hemodynamically unstable patients. There are lots of branches to remember, but the key take-home message from this is if you look at this diagram here, you see piriformis, you see the superior gluteal artery, and you can understand that you know, the, the sharp fascia of piriformis can sometimes cause an injury to the, the superior gluteal artery. And that's one of the most commonest um, vessels to be injured when you have injuries to the posterior ring. The other important uh, vascular anatomy to know is, is, is the corona mortis uh, and the so-called circle of, circle of death. And if you look at this diagram here, it's an abnormal um, anatomical communication between uh, the obturator artery and the external iliac. And in about 35% of cases, the arterial uh, component is, is quite large and is substantial. So you've got to look for this, you've got to ligate it. Uh, if you do injure it, the bleeding could be catastrophic. So it's important to know that. And then the venous plexus, you know, we talk about bleeding with the unstable pelvis. And where do they bleed from? Well, the majority of them will bleed from these veins and the venous plexus. And it's important to realize where this pelvis, uh, where this uh, 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 venous plexus lies. And it's just anterior to the sacrum and the SI joint. So you can understand that an injury to this area will cause intense bleeding. It's important to also understand that the, uh, the urethra and the bladder lies just behind the anterior synthesis or the anterior pelvic ring. So if you, if you think about it, an injury to the anterior pelvic ring does put the, the bladder, the bladder neck, the urethra at risk. And it's important to understand that. So radiology. We've talked about some of the soft tissues, some of the uh, important anatomical um, factors of the intact pelvic ring. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the radiology of the intact pelvic ring. And it's important in any trauma series you have an AP pelvis, and the AP pelvis forms part of the trauma series, and you can get a lot of information from the pelvis. You can see here that there's a slight mismatch at the synthesis. Uh, that will take you to look at the rest of the pelvis as well. And if, you, if you're suspicious of a pelvic ring injury, always get more imaging, okay? Always assess the patient further, always get more imaging. What more imaging are you going to get? Well, the classic teaching with the, with the pelvic ring injuries is to, is to obtain um, x-rays with, with 90 degree um, alternate views. Uh, and essentially with the pelvis, you, you obtain the pelvic inlet view. Uh, the pelvic outlet view, and then you can move on to a, a CT scan to further define the injury. The pelvic inlet view and the pelvic outlet view are shown here, uh, and you can see how the uh, x-rays are taken. That's the inlet view, looking inside the pelvis. That's the outlet view, looking at the uh, uh, pelvis from, uh, from uh, uh, caudal to uh, cranial direction. And this is what you see, this is what you typically see. The inlet view can be very helpful, and it can be helpful in determining whether there's any posterior displacement of the hemipelvis. It can also tell us a, a lot of information about the sacrum and the sacral alar, and it can give us an idea as to the rotation in the horizontal plane. So if one hemipelvis is rotated in comparison to the other side. And this is a, a radiograph of the inlet view, and you can see the intact pelvic ring looking pretty symmetrical apart from a little fracture there. The outlet view is good at telling us about the, the vertical displacement. It also gives us a, a view of the sacral foramenine, there and there, can't see them behind there, but there and there, there and there. And it also gives us a, a view of the transverse processes. Here's a radiograph of the outlet view. You can see the sacral iliac joints on both sides. You can see the sacral foramen. Um, you can see the transverse process should be just there, but there's a sacralization there. 
So CT scan, why do we get a CT scan? Well, CT scan is very helpful. So it does complement your radiological imaging. And, and why does it help? Well it, well, it certainly defines the posterior injury better. It tells us about the degree of displacement of the fracture rather than, than the impaction, because impaction might imply that it's a stable fracture, whereas distraction or displacement of a fracture may mean that it's unstable. It tells us about the rotation of the fragments, it tells us about the amount of the comminution, and it allows us to assess the new, uh, neural foramina also. There are certain signs of instability, and certainly sacroiliac displacement of, of greater than five millimeter in any plane may mean that this is potentially unstable. A posterior fracture gap, as I mentioned, may potentially mean this fracture is potentially unstable. A volsion of the fifth lumbar transverse process or lateral border of the sacrum, so the sacral tuberous or the sacral spinous ligament, again, may indicate that this is a, a sign of instability. So in summary, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, um, what we've talked about over the last few minutes is we've talked about the anatomy of the impact pelvis uh, and the pelvic contents. And it's important to understand the anatomy and knowing what is normal, because if you know what is normal, you'll be able to appreciate what is abnormal. If you appreciate what is abnormal, you can relate that to other potential injuries that may accompany that, that particular fracture type. And if you appreciate all the, all the things that go together with this injury, then you'll be, hopefully be able to give the best form of treatment to the patient. Thank you.